discussion. Welcome to another episode of Siren Sundays. We are in season six. This is episode three with me, your host, Lashanti, and today our wonderful guest, Dr. William Gustav, who is not an unfamiliar face, but we have not seen you in a while. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Lashanti. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been really busy, but I had to make time this summer to come again. I definitely appreciate it. We always enjoy your wisdom. And you had such a great diagram last time talking about the uptake of heavy metals in soil. Um, but I do, I don't want to talk about you too much. I want you to talk about yourself. So can you just give us a brief introduction of who you are for some of the people who may not have seen you in your last episode? Sure, no problem. So um, I am a biogeochemist by uh, um, training. And um, my main interest is to study how the living part of the soil interact with the non-living part of the soil. More specifically, I'm interested, I'm super interested in microbes and how microbes can um, transform heavy metals in the soil and what that means for us, especially for um, food and food con and contamination in foods. Um, I, I did uh, my undergrad right here at the University of the Bahamas, then College of the Bahamas. Then I did a master's in environmental chemistry at um, at Nanjing University of Information Science and Technology. And after that, I went to the University of Liverpool and did my PhD in environmental science with a focus in biogeochemistry. And doing my PhD, I've always studied microbes and how they interact with um, the non-living components of the soil and how that affect food quality. Definitely very well versed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I do want to point out, because I know one of the things that you had talked about in your last episode that I had mentioned that I wanted you to discuss just briefly today, what is the difference, you know, between soil versus dirt? And I know you mentioned this non-living and living parts of soil. So can you talk a bit about that? Well, um... <laughs> feelings about the difference. <laughs> so I'm very passionate about soil. And it's very important for us to understand that soil is not dirt. Dirt is what you get on your clothes and what's under your fingernail and your belly button. That's <laughs> dirt. But soil is the is a living component of the earth. Without soil, most of us today would not be here. In fact, we would be dead by 40. Um, if you had a bacterial infection, you would be dead because most of the antibiotics that we use today come from a microbe that inhabit the soil. And without these antibiotics, you know what would happen to us. We'll, we'll, we'll be dropping like flies, like in the Viking ages. <laughs> um, soil filter our drinking water. Without the soil, a lot of our um, groundwater reserves won't be clean. Um, soil act as, I like to call it the womb, where you can grow all of the food that we eat. So soil mm -hmm. is very important. Soil is very um, diverse in terms of organisms that live in it. Um, soil contains a lot of the nutrients that we need to use. So it's very different from dirt. Dirt, on the other hand, is just something that's a bother to us, you know, something that's unpleasant. So soil is not dirt. We cannot and we should never con uh, confuse the two. Soil is living. Dirt is non-living. Right. And you did mention that soil that you study, you're interested in the living and non-living parts of soil itself. So what are some of the living parts and these non-living parts that you referred to? So soil is very diverse. You can find more um, different microorganisms and even macroorganisms living in the soil that you will find living on on the surface of the soil. So that's a, the so the living component of the soil will be mostly the microorganisms. For example, your bacteria and archaea, and then you have some eukaryotic cells. Um, the soil will um, the the in the soil you also have minerals. And you have, and these are the non-living component. You have the, so the the minerals. You have um, the soil particles. You have um, other contaminants that find its way in the soil. Mm -hmm. And the way they interact is very, very important because it, it's normally the living component of the soil because they also want to remain alive. So, mm -hmm. in order as a survival mechanism, they need to transform these non-living components to forms that would not get rid of them. And when they do do that, they mobilize these non-living components of the soil, and then it can seep into the groundwater. It become available for plants. Plants can take it up. And once plants taking up stuff or it's seeping into your groundwater, it's only a matter of time before it makes it to your table. And then, you know, you got to consume that. So th th this interaction 
is what I'm really interested in and how to limit this interaction or how to take full advantage of it, this interaction to help prevent this leaching of these contaminants uh, and so on. And that's such a life lesson in itself, right? Like the things that we don't see, we don't appreciate. And so oftentimes, you know, the things that we do with our soil to kill it, it's, it's, there is no connection to it. And I do hope that through your work, you can um, inspire people to care more about the soil, because like you said, it's, it's vital to our very living um, on this planet. Uh, so thank you for that brief overview. And I know the thing that we came to talk about today, which has been buzzing around for a while, and I stumbled across this paper. I shared the link in the chat for um, for all the viewers to kind of tap into if you want. It was a study in Bonaire that talked about using this sargasm. Like we see the seaweed wash up on shore pretty much every year now in high quantities. And oftentimes people suggest, hey, well, this can be used as a fertilizer. So can you just kind of break through some of these um, reasons why it's being suggested and if this is even a good idea? Well, let's have the using um, seaweed, in, in fact, brown algae, or any type of algae as a fertilizer is nothing new. This was something that's always been done over centuries. So because once you add the seaweed into the soil, it's going to add organic matter, so food, to the soil. And the microbes in the soil, the population is going to increase and they're going to get very active. And if you have a healthy microbial community in the soil, then these microbes also offer some benefits to the plants. It can help the plants deal with drought. It can help the plants deal with diseases. And the plants in return also, you know, the plants, microbes and plants, they have this battering system that's going on in the soil. I give you food, you give me protection. So <laughs> the more microbes you have, the happier the plants are because the plants don't have to pump out all of this sugar for the um, for the um, microbes. They can get it. So when you add in this organic matter, it's increasing the soil quality. It increased the organic matter content of the soil. It increased the soil biomass, the amount of microbes that's in the soil. It increased the soil pore structure. It makes the soil more aerated so you don't have to worry about roots being rot. Um, these seaweeds, they are extremely good at fixing nitrogen. Although nitrogen is very abundant in the atmosphere, but it's not available to plants. So the seaweeds can fix it into a form that's it's available to the plants, and then the plants will use it. And, you know, if nitrogen is available, plants will use it and you get higher crop yield, better quality crop, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex and interconnected relationship that they have. So that's why in coastal cities especially, it's it, seaweed has been used as a we call it an organic soil amendment because it can provide all of these benefits to the soil so now this study that we saw and as i said i did share that link in the comment section for people who want to also read it the, the very title of it kind of shocked me because i know in your last talk you did talk about this heavy metals being you know deposited into the soil and it says that sargasm fertilizer transfers heavy metals to these vegetables specifically one being arsenic so can you just first tell us what is arsenic <laughs> <laughs> So I, I tend to, and every time I talk about arsenic, I, I, I talk about arsenic, I, I tend to direct people attention to those old movies, where, <laughs> especially with the, uh, you know, those movies about these monarchs. And then you see they have someone tasting the food before they actually <laughs> eat the food. Because arsenic, it's a poison. It's been used for years to get rid of the monarchs. So if you can't <laughs> wait for your turn and you want to expedite it, you feed whoever's in power arsenic. And that's why we use silver spores, because arsenic will react with silver and cause the silver to change color. So in those days, once they notice that, then, oh, this is poison food. We need it. But arsenic naturally occurs in the earth crust, in our fresh water, and in the ocean. There's tons of arsenic. In fact, you have up to 0 0.3 ppm. So that's a lot. Let's just say it's a lot of arsenic in the ocean. Seaweed, on the other hand, has lots of good functional groups. Hmm. So these functional groups, for lack of a better term, will act as a magnet. So they can literally attract and trap. So the ocean naturally have arsenic. Seaweed can attract and store this arsenic in their tissue, and the seaweed is in the ocean. So when you pick up seaweed and you measure the arsenic content in seaweed, 
Remember now, the ocean is only 0 0.23 ppm. You can have up to 1 ppm per kilogram of seaweed of arsenic. So it's a lot. It's, yeah. it's a lot more. So it hyperaccumulates that arsenic. Mm -hmm. But arsenic has different forms. The organic form of arsenic for years, and even today, we know it's not toxic. You eat it, you flush it out with your urine, no problem. But what we since learn is that microbes, both in the soil and microbes that live in your gut, in your intestines, mm -hmm. they can carry out a process that can transform this fairly non-toxic, you know, you wouldn't get sick from version of arsenic into a very toxic form of arsenic, the inorganic form of arsenic. And that is very problematic. These inorganic form of arsenic, if you look at West Bengal in India, about 10% of the population suffer from some form of cancer because they're drinking water which has so much of this inorganic form of arsenic. It can cause um, internal cancers in your organs, damage your liver, your bladder. Um, it's been associated with high blood pressure and diabetes. So it's very, very bad for our health. So just to wrap it up, you have the organic arsenic, not so bad, but the microbes in the soil and your stomach, they are affected by that organic arsenic. They can convert that to the inorganic arsenic to protect themselves, but that byproduct is not good for us. It can cause lots of problems. And so basically what you're saying, just avoid arsenic. <laughs> well, you would want to, but right. our water's full of arsenic. Rice? Full of arsenic. <laughs> I remember the white rice. Is, no, was it the brown rice? Was brown the rice, because arsenic accumulate more in the germ. So, you know, we think brown <laughs> rice is healthy, but white rice is full of arsenic. So you can't really avoid it. You just need to make sure you take it in in moderation. Small amounts, your body can deal with it. So when you go to those fancy restaurants and they give you that one little tiny scoop of rice, that's your serving. That's all you're supposed to have. Per day, if you're having more than that, then you set yourself up for problem. And this, and I know we're talking about seaweed and sargasm next, but I do have just a quick question because I just remembered how I feel like it was a TV show or a movie because this is how, as children, we digest most of our information. Where they were saying that apple seeds contain arsenic, and and this character in the show was just collecting apple seeds in hopes to one day poison somebody with arsenic. Could that actually happen? Um, it could, but that person will have to eat so much apple seeds. <laughs> That's going to be ridiculous. Like, why are you just eating that much apple seed? In fact, almost everything today have arsenic in it because, be, you know, in the past, arsenic, arsenic is actually pretty good, right? For example, in the chicken farms, a little bit of arsenic help promote growth in chickens. So your small little chicken, a little bit of arsenic, and within a couple of days, you have a big chicken. Um, your arsenic is actually a major component of many herbicides. So many fields, they would have sprayed arsenic to keep down the weed. So almost every farm, especially if it's one of those traditional farms, one that's been around for a very long time, would have mm -hmm. arsenic in it. Again, they would have the organic version of arsenic. But as I explained earlier, you have microbes in the soil that can convert this organic one, a version of arsenic, the less toxic form of arsenic, to the more toxic inorganic form. So, yeah, <laughs> can't get around it. And I did find out it was Orange is the New Black. That's the show. Not too long ago, but definitely, obviously, people still talking about it. And so, like I said, in this study, it highlighted the fact that the vegetables that they were growing with this sargasm fertilizer were like 37 times more, like these large numbers times more with arsenic than their counterparts that were growing in the plain potting soil. So, and it wasn't calcium, it was cadmium. That's oh, the, cadmium, just that's as bad, worse than arsenic. In fact, right. cadmium and calcium, they are very similar. Wow. In terms of chemical properties. And that cadmium replaces your calcium in your bones. And so it, your bones remain very brittle and you have, you, you suffer from a lot of, deformity oh, wow. from uh, excessive amount of calcium and they have completely opposite biochemistry but that's something we can get into later right yeah so it was saying that that those levels are also higher in the plants grown in this sargasm fertilizer so now we got the cadmium and now this arsenic and so are we now finding out based on this study um in bonaire that we probably should not 
be using sargasm as a fertilizer? Well, I wouldn't say we should not, but we should be very careful of it. So studies have shown that in coastal cities and coastal um, countries like here that uses um, this brown seaweed as a fertilizer tend yeah. to have 10 times more arsenic in their soil as compared to other places where seaweed is not used. And that's because, as I explained earlier, seaweed hyperaccumulate arsenic. So when you take the seaweed from the ocean and you bring it to your pristine soil, and if you've been doing it long enough, the amount of arsenic that you're adding in that soil continues to build up and build up and it gets more. The good news is that one, arsenic biogeochemistry, the way arsenic moves in the soil saves us a lot. Mm -hmm. So if you know that the soil has a large amount of arsenic, then you need to choose the crops that you would grow in that soil. And why this is important, because different species of arsenic not only determine the toxicity of arsenic, it also determine the mobility of arsenic. So for example, we have two inorganic species of arsenic that we tend to see in soil, arsenic-3 and arsenic-5. So arsenic-3 is way more toxic than arsenic-5. And it's also way more mobile than arsenic-5. And I'm going to explain this in a bit. So arsenic-5, what is inside the soil, you can think of it, you can think of it, it's being trapped. Because in the soil, we have lots of iron. And an iron act as a, you know, you ever had bubble gum on the issue? Yeah. And as you walk, it attracts stuff. Yeah. So that's how iron acts. Iron <laughs> trapped the arsenic-5. Arsenic-5, it, 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 it's attracted to iron. So that arsenic-5, yes, it's in the soil. But because it's attracted and trapped on the surface of iron, it's not available for plants. So plants wouldn't take it up, right? So the arsenic tend to remain in the soil and it doesn't go into your plants. However, if you now change the, let's say you change it to a crop that's going to acidify the soil, like tomatoes. Mm. Tomatoes is going to cause the iron to dissolve. The arsenic five that was trapped on the surface of the iron will now be transformed to arsenic three, which dissolved in the soil pore water, so the water in the soil. Mm -hmm. And then plants on the roots, they have special cells called aquaporin. So these are just cells on the plant root that enables the plant to take up water. It's supposed to only allow water through. But arsenic three can slip through these aquaporins and be taken up by the plant. Plants need phosphate because phosphate is a very important ingredient for growth for plants. Mm -hmm. That same arsenic can also be accidentally taken up as phosphate by the plant. Once it's inside the plant, the plant also wants to live. So they have <laughs> evolved in a way, okay, I'm going to store this arsenic maybe in my leaves or in the fruit that I'm producing so it mm -hmm. doesn't kill me. And then when we go and fix this fruit up and we eat it, then mm. we have a problem. So yes, seaweed is good because it's going to improve the soil quality. It's going to add nutrients to the soil. But at the same time, it can contribute to the you know, level. It can add more heavy metals into our soil. And depending on the heavy metal that is being added, well, if you should choose carefully which crop you grow on that plot. And if it could, you know, if you can avoid it, because if you can avoid like adding the seaweed directly into the field, like by washing it off, because washing it off also removes some of that heavy metal, You because it's only sorb, it's only absorbing it. Mm -hmm. uh, before, or do some other form of pretreatment before adding it into um, your plot, then that can also help in decreasing the amount. Right. So, so I found that in the same um, study, the bok choy seemed to have had the most. And is that because what you were just saying, like obviously the plant wants to live, so it's now pushing it into its, its leaves and bok choy is more or less like a leafy vegetable. So are those the ones more at risk of like killing us? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, arsenic is actually very toxic to the plant, right? So certain plants will simply not grow inside uh, um, environments where uh, the concentration of arsenic is too high because the toxicity will get rid of them. But there are plants that have special genes 
there's a gene that helps it to tolerate the arsenic. It's a detoxification gene. So these plants will grow and they will hyperaccumulate. So if the plant, we say express this gene, simply means have this ability to deal with arsenic, then it will hyperaccumulate it. And bok choy is one of those plants that, yes, arsenic is toxic to it, but it have a way to coexist with the arsenic. You're going to come in and I'm going to store you someplace so you don't cause damage anyway. But mm. unfortunately, the above part, right, what we eat from the Chinese cabbage bok choy <laughs> is where it's storing it. So <laughs> that, you also get the arsenic from it. Mm. Um, I do want to take a moment to point out one of your former students saying hi, um, Nandi Maynard. Um, oh, Ms. Maynard. I remember Ms. Maynard. <laughs> Very, an awesome student, by the way. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, and so, and so this, like I said, this study happened in Bonaire, and I, I am not aware. You can enlighten me if you're aware of anyone currently in the Bahamas that has been using sargasm as fertilizer. Uh, yes, a lot of farmers, especially farmers or that farms are located in their coastal areas, have mm -hmm. been using sargasm as um a, as a soil amendment. In mm -hmm. fact, I have a student now in Long Island that's using sargasm as a soil amendment. And we are, well, she's doing her final year project with that. And she's studying to see um, how that not only affect the soil quality, but affect the fruit quality that is produced from the soil that, that this um, um, product is being added to. And another way people have been using um, sargasm, in fact, you can go to the, to the plant store. And when you go and you get these organic fertilizers, when mm -hmm. you look, at the, con the the ingredients, a lot of them are seaweeds, especially the, we call them failed ones, the ones you add not to the soil, you add it to the leaf of the plant. So the plants can take in the nutrients by you adding it on the surface are made from seaweed, some seaweed extract. So a lot of people have been using it, especially organic farms. Yeah, and I know we had a comment earlier from Kayla Stubbs Moore who said, you know, our past generations have always done this on our family island. So I actually had no idea that um, and this is me being obviously Nassau centric. I'm trying to get better. My family <laughs> island people. Um, I had no idea that you know we, what we thought was such an innovative idea here in Nassau. Um, people on our family islands have already been kind of tapping into this. this yeah. so. <laughs> adding, to, adding seaweed to the soil is not new. It's just well, we, we remember now we started with organic based fertilizers. Mm -hmm. And then we quickly switch into synthetic fertilizers because they are cheaper. You get better good quality. And then we saw what happened in the United States and other part of the world where you, they exploited these fertilizers. Yeah. And now we are just shipping gears and returning back to organic amendments. But organic amendments have always been used. I just always assumed, and again, not only am I, am I have I raised been raised NASA centric, but I've also just been very ignorant of anything agriculture, right? That we always just use like manure, you know, chicken, cow, manure. Like I, I just never imagined that we would be getting things from the sea to fertilize our soil. So is it better than that? Is is using the seaweed better than using our, our cow um, manure? In, in, our in my opinion, a million times better. Because not only do you get the heavy metals from using the chicken manure, you also get antibiotic resistant genes. So you get germs that if you become infected with, that you will not be able to treat them easily with antibiotics that are available. Wow. The reason that happens is because we give these livestock lots of antibiotic to keep yeah. them healthy. So that so microbes that still live in their intestinal tract, a lot of them are resistant to that drug. But they are also pathogenic to us. They can also cause us to get sick. Mm -hmm. And then when we add it directly to, to the plants, and if we become infected by these microbes, when you go to the hospital and your physician prescribe an antibiotic for you, that antibiotic might not work because that microbe can be resistant to that. In addition to the... the um, infection from the these super bugs as Miss Reed Mr. Well, as DeAndre, Mr. Reed is, is referring to them. Um you also have arsenic. Remember at some point I said that arsenic is a very good um um growth stimulator. So mm -hmm. you give chicks a little bit of arsenic, 
and it stimulates growth. It helps them to grow very, very fast. You get more meat on them very quickly. So a lot of that arsenic is added, well, the organic arsenic is added to the feed. And a lot of that is expelled with the fecal matter that we use to make the manure. Right. And so when you add that to your plot, you are adding arsenic into your plot as well. Wow. Um, and I know I did see a comment earlier um, where the, this is my wonderful Aunt Denise, um, she was told recently about cyanide in mango seeds, um, which is why, and I think she also noted the veterinarian told them, obviously, try not to let your dogs eat these mango seeds. Is this another tactic that plants, this obviously the mango tree has been using with like cyanide instead of arsenic, where it's storing this toxic, you know, element? Uh, no, it, cyanide is a little bit different. You see, arsenic is an element itself, while well, cyanide is more like a, a compound. So okay. the plant may naturally produce it mm -hmm. and store it. Maybe it helps later on for germination of that seed. I'm not 100% sure, but it's very different. So you're not going to uptake whole cyanide from the environment. That organism is going to produce it itself. Mm -hmm. It's more like, you can think about it like a metabolic byproduct. Hmm, interesting. I know Nandi noted, um, we need this information to reach more of our budding backyard farmers in the Bahamas. So many have become discouraged because their crops can't seem to grow. Could their soil be the issue? Well, in the Bahamas, soil definitely can be the issue because, I, and I think last time I explained that, <laughs> and we're a very interesting group of people in the Bahamas. The first thing we do after we buy a, a plot of land is we remove the living part of the soil and then we spend hundreds of dollars getting this well we call it the curry yeah the, <laughs> the white soil and then we we put it in the backyard and then we dig our foundation build our homes on it and then later on we want to plant stuff on this curry this this curry has no organic matter very little uh, um organism microorganisms living in it the ph is sky high because it's calcium carbonate so a lot of the nutrients like phosphate are not even available for your plant. And then we want to grow green grass on that. And we wonder why our coconuts are yellow, our <laughs> grass are yellow, and they're, they're not producing anything. And most of the time it's because of that. Yeah. And, you know, the islands are very young, very, very young. So the soil layer is very, the living part of the soil layer is very, very thin. You can easily remove it and get to the bedrock. And the bedrock is not good for growth. It's too hard. The pH mm -hmm. is too high and the nutrients are, are too depleted in that, in that area. Right. And so um, D'Angelo does bring up the question, uh, are you talking about the sand we mix the cement with? So for, for the background information on people who missed your last episode, can you explain what this, well, not curry, I think it's called quarry, but Bahamians just in our <laughs> culture, we call it curry. Um, curry. Can, you, can you explain what that is? Well, a very good example of that is, uh, D'Angelo, if you ever drive on Samila Butler Highway near the end, you'll see these two big, uh, um, I, I guess, the hills on both sides. So what we normally do, we cut down the hills and we break it down and then we sell that for filling because it's good to lift your property up, prevent flooding later on. And it's also used to fill the foundation. Uh, and then you pour the concrete on top. So it saves a lot in building. So that, that's what I'm referring to. And we, you know, whenever you see someone is beautifying their yard, especially right after they are built, it's it's that same white um, soil that they pour uh, in the front base. Not white dirt? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's okay. soil. It's still living. It's just poor quality soil. Yeah. So it is just essentially <laughs> the limestone rock broken up. Broken up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, which which makes total sense. And we did get an aha oh moment from D'Angelo. Um, but I, and you know, this, to just continue back on to the sargasm and, and thinking about what Nandi Maynard had said, what would you recommend some of these backyard farmers that are struggling, obviously with possibly their soil health, would you recommend that they just go out there, grab some sargasm from the coastline and mix it with their soil? Um, <laughs> I think, well, I, 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 my humble opinion would be it's possible and it's cheap. It's readily available so we and it's sustainable, so we should make full use of it. But mm -hmm. do not just grab the brown algae and then take it home and add it to your soil. You have to ensure that you understand how to pre-treat it. 
So the first thing you can, you must do, because it's coming from the ocean. The ocean contains lots of salt. You don't want to just add that to your um, garden directly because it's going to increase the salt concentration. And that's very, very bad, you know. It doesn't mineralize the, the soil? It doesn't. It, it actually um very toxic to the plant because it makes a lot of the nutrients not available for the plant. So the mm. plant won't be able to get the nutrients that it needs and then the plant will eventually die. So I would say the first thing you need to do before you even think about collecting the um, brown algae is to um, first get yourself a salinity meter because you can't just taste it. You can't just use your gut feeling and say <laughs> that you have decreased the salt enough. And then you can soak the seaweed and soaking will not only just decrease the, um, decrease the salt concentration, it will also help to wash away some of the metals that that seaweed may have um, accumulated because most of the metal is only absorbed and it's loosely absorbed by that seaweed because of the functional groups of the seaweed. So once you wash it off long enough, you get rid of some of that. With and fresh after, water. Good yeah, fresh, fresh water. water. <laughs> fre definitely <laughs> fresh <Chlorine> water. water. <laughs> definitely fresh water. And then you can um, use that seaweed and um, add it to your uh, um, um, plot of land. But instead, of, you know, another alternative we can use is freshwater um, algae. Freshwater algae is actually pretty good. You know, freshwater algae accumulate very, very little um, arsenic because in freshwater, especially here in the Bahamas, based on, you know, our groundwater, it, it doesn't have much background arsenic in it. And it's normally a big problem. You have when you have algae bloom, your whole water, especially if you have a pool, you're not taking good care of it. Then you have the green algae growing on it. Mm -hmm. It's full of nutrients. It's high productivity. If you have a pool, turn off the circulation for a week or so. <laughs> you have lots of it in there, and you don't have to worry about the um, increasing the salinity of your soil because it's coming from fresh water. Yeah. Um, it adds a lot of nitrates into the soil that the plants will be more than happy to use and it adds organic matter to the soil and add all of the benefits that you would get from the um brown algae the seaweed nice i know nandy also asked um if you have any thoughts on permaculture farming i'm not very familiar with permaculture farming I, I, are you familiar with it Lashandi? i did have an episode <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> on permaculture um, and uh, permaculture design. Uh, so, Nandi, I, if you just go back into the live area of episodes, it should be there. If not, I will share it into these comments after the show. Um, but off the top of my head, unfortunately, I am unable to recall that information. But we have done an episode on permaculture farming. So please feel free to watch that after um, this episode. So, sorry, Nandi. Um, <laughs> I'm a basic scientist. I just study <laughs> <No>. mechanisms. <laughs> I'm not... Yeah, so we are more interested in studying why and how things work from the mechanistic perspective okay. rather than the application itself. You know, you have to do you have to know the basics before you apply it and then you cause problems later. <laughs> That's true. And I think and that is a very important part of science that I think a lot of people uh, negate really. Everyone just wants to be able to discover things and, and something new, but if you don't have these basic and I hate saying calling you a basic scientist, but if you don't have some of these foundational, maybe that's a better a word. <laughs> foundational scientists that that are making sure that the foundation is good and strong to build these innovations. Um, but I do want to jump back one more time to the uh -huh. paper and and back to the bok choy example. Well, example really results that they had gotten where you know it had thirty seven times more arsenic in it. So if I was to eat that bok choy you know, would that be detrimental immediately to me? Or is it just if I eat it over time? Or so what would be the effects of someone eating this bok choy or any of these um, vegetables or fruits that have, you know, obviously attained this high level of arsenic? That's a very good question. Um, and I, I've read that paper as well. One of the issue with that paper, yes, it's 37 times more arsenic than compared to your pristine plot. But mm -hmm. it doesn't, 37 times more doesn't mean that it hit the threshold where if you eat that plant, that material, you'll get sick, right? Hmm, okay. Because a lot of that arsenic, first, they didn't um, 
it's PCA the arsenic. So we don't know if it's organic or inorganic. Because remember, if it's organic, yes, it's going to have high arsenic. Like, yeah. for example, if you buy rice from the food store, very high arsenic concentration in many of them, right? <laughs> but it's organic arsenic. You eat right. it, you flush most of it out. So we have to first think about um, the amount of inorganic arsenic that's present in it. So mm -hmm. as long as the inorganic arsenic concentration is less than 2 ppm in foods, it's good, and less than 10 ppb in drinking water, then you shouldn't have a problem with it. So, sorry. Sorry, what were you going to say? Because uh, we can metabolize and process low concentration of arsenic with no problem, only when it's too much, then it becomes problematic. Like, let's say, you know, you're eating rice with high arsenic concentration, rice and sausage rice. for breakfast, <laughs> um, rice and tuna for lunch, then rice and chicken for dinner. And you've been doing this uh, an extended period of time, then you set yourself up for some issue. But if you just eat it once and you eat the recommended amount, then it's not problematic. Yeah, and I think before I ask the question I was going to ask, I just do want to just highlight that, right? Like, I think here in the Bahamas, we are known for just our, our poor quality of health, right? And a lot of times it's attributed to the food, but I think a lot of people don't understand, right? Like our serving size, our serving portions, that white rice, uh, which is better than brown, even though a lot of people are converting to brown rice, eating that, and and like you said, you said it jokingly, but there is this new wave now of eating rice at breakfast. And we know we eat rice at dinner, and sometimes we eat rice at lunch. So increasing our amount of rice, not only does it have implications on our weight, right? Because now this is these carbs that we're eating that's causing us to gain weight. But, you know, this underlying thing of this arsenic that is now, like you said, it's tied to high blood pressure and it's tied to diabetes. So on top of those two factors and this, you know, potential increase in weight gain, we got to eat better, you know? Like, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we did a survey for a publication that uh, that we have based on Bohemian, um, the amount of rice that the average Bohemian consume. Believe it or not, we consume rice, the same amount of rice as compared to what, you know, when you, when you think about people who eat rice, you automatically think about the Asians, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But our daily consumption is just about high, in fact, a little bit higher than the Asian consumption of rice. Wow. We consume a lot of rice. I mean, if you go to Oandres for dinner, you know, they give you, they give you a bag of rice, like a thousand servings. Well, yeah, yeah. So I think, yeah, that's important. But I know you noted that, and I might mess your numbers up, so correct me, please. You said in food, it's 0.23 parts per million, but in water, it was once it stays under 10 parts per billion. Was that what that was? Yeah. So uh, in foods, it can range anywhere between 0 0.5 to 2 parts per million. Yes. That's inorganic arsenic. When inorganic. The w inorganic, yes. Okay. The organic arsenic, we tend to, um, well, the current, the current standards ignore the organic arsenic. Okay. As I explained earlier, organic arsenic is considered non-toxic. Right. Unless it's converted into inorganic arsenic. So between 0 0.5 and 2 ppm, in your solid foods, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's fine. But in water, it needs to be, well, the safe drinking limit, believe it or not, um, I think only New Jersey, because they have extremely, for some reason, they have extremely strict requirements for the drinking water quality, mm -hmm. meets that. Most oh, places it doesn't meet that. The concentration of arsenic is much higher than that in the drinking water. I scared Dax if you know what I'm drinking water. Huh? <laughs> I actually don't know, but the good thing is behemoths don't drink tap water. So we, oh, tend, well, to drink, we tend to drink um, distilled well, water a, a, a lot so, or water that has um, went through um, um, very good filtration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I will assume it's very low, but that's why our water is very expensive. Right. Because, you know, the reason why they, they haven't met that requirement in, in like public water, you'll be paying so much for a gallon of public water and it, mm -hmm. it won't be accessible to many individuals. So they try to find a balance where it's not good for you, but it's not going to kill you now. Yeah, that's that's so scary. Um, yeah. But I don't want to ignore, I know Rhea Thompson um, 
welcome. I don't think I've ever seen her tune in. She did ask about your thoughts on Bahamian soil viability for farming. I know we touched on that a bit earlier, but if you can just give like maybe two sentences about the typical Bahamian soil viability. This is the un uncurried <laughs> soil. Yeah. Uncurried um, soil. Well, especially, unfortunately for New Providence Island and many of our other islands, they're very young islands. So the soil, the living part of the soil is very uh, um, shallow, just a, a little bit like less than two to three centimeters thick. So because the soil is, the living layer is so thin, so our soil are um, extremely susceptible to being degraded very quickly. And the pH of our soil is also very high. So adding for the, if we're adding um, inorga inorganic fertilizers, a lot of it will be leached out very quickly from it. So, I, and I don't want to sound like I'm not on the train that we're going to feed ourselves, but I think we're not going to be able to meet that goal if we are just growing stuff on New Providence. We have to go to right. other islands where have much better soil quality like Andrus and I think Elutra, they have much better soil quality. They have much thicker layer of soil and so on. Because if you look in your backyard and you stick your pickaxe, it doesn't take much to hit the bedrock. And remember, as I explained earlier, the bedrock, not very much nutrients yeah. that's going to be there. Yeah. And I know Nandi makes the comment, um, we import most of our food. We have to do a better job at food regulation to ensure that we are consuming, what we are consuming is not poisonous to our bodies, especially in today's world of fast and cheap food production. Well, that's a very good question, Nandi. And I think most behemoths are not aware of that we do have um, the Bureau of Standards that I, I don't remember the whole name of it, but it's located right on Bacardi Road. Is it Baths? It's oh, I know this one too. But yes, they have been doing an amazing job in ensuring that the food that we are importing are of a particular quality, and they do market surveys. They do they test stuff in the in the market, and they have been doing an amazing job of that. I, I have um, um, collaborated with them, especially on rice, and mm -hmm. they have been doing an amazing job. So and I think, I, I think it, 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 world, it, correct. Sorry. Christopher Worrell, that's the one that he's um he's in charge of? I think it's Christopher, but I've always dealt with um Dr. Patricia Johnson. Okay. Yeah, I just but remember I, he was the same organization. Yeah, but yeah. They, they, they've been doing an amazing job with that, I, okay. I must say. That's good to know. I think we definitely have been seeing a shift lately um, as, as our generation steps up. I mean, I think we're such a great generation, right? So, <laughs> but as our generation has been stepping up, we are, a lot of us are going out and studying things that we are bringing back home and hopefully more people can come back home and not be discouraged by some of our, um, our ways. Uh, Cause I do have hope for, for our little country, you know, um, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I always tell um, my um, friends and others that are studying abroad, come home. I, I mean, we, we offer a lot. You, you just have, you, you just have to come and find them. There's a lot of, of things that are available to us. And it's there just waiting for us to come and get it. Mm -hmm. um, the university is a very good place to work. They have lots of incentive to retaining and bringing bohemians back. Um, you have the government agencies. There's, there's a lot of things we can do home. Just make sure that whatever you choose to do, you're doing it for the love of the field and not for um, other reasons. Because if you're doing it and you like it, you're going to have a good time for home. Especially sure. in academia. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think we have so much promise and potential at, at UB. Um, I know when you and I first met, the first thing you told me was, go get your PhD and come home and work at the university. So maybe one day. <laughs> I got oh, the PhD I, yet. I, I, I have a strong feeling and I am normally not wrong. It's only a matter of time before you get it. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I know we have some questions trickling in. I do want to make sure. Um, we address most of these. Uh, so what happens to a poison deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? I'm not sure I understand. Like, if, I guess we leave the poison in the plants? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure if I understand, but I, I will make an assumption that you are referring to what happens to the contaminants that are added to the soil. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, mm -hmm. unfortunately, whatever you add to the soil, will stay in the soil for a very, very long time, if not forever. Mm -hmm. It's extremely costly 
and inefficient to try to remove metals from the soil. Um, others have, you know, people have like plants that will hypoaccumulate, take up a lot of uh, metals from the soil. Yes, that do remove metals from the soil, but then the next question is, where do you put that plant after it's full of the metal? So basically you just remove it from location A to location B. Some people have done work where they use electricity to propel these metals by, uh, you know, metals have charges, yeah, a charge and they move towards the, the opposite and you can pull them out. But then the question is after you have a, one, it's extremely expensive. You pay your BPL bill, you'll know it's extremely expensive. <laughs> Two, it's um, very inefficient. Okay. It's efficient in small settings, but when you're talking about acres of land, it's very, very inefficient. So it doesn't work the amount of money you, you're going to spend mm -hmm. as the, you know, to the amount of metals you're going to pull out from the soil. So the main goal here is to not put it in the soil in the first place. Mm -hmm. And lastly, unlike air pollution, the sky turns gray, people see it. People have a problem with it. It forced policymakers to develop new policies to prevent it. When things get in the soil, we don't see it with our eyes. Or some of us expect the soil to be dirty. You know, that, that's just how we were brought up. Mm -hmm. So you don't think it's a problem until later down the road when it's causing a problem. You know, you no longer can use this parcel of land for anything. Can't even live in it. Can't even build a park on it because the soil become airborne too. And then we breathe yeah. it in and you can get poison from it. So just yeah. not put it in in the first place. Yeah, I know I, I um, and I know I see two more questions in the chat, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. And I think it was a documentary. Uh, it was talking about just land ownership, property ownership in America, United States. And there was this one area, and I think it was New Orleans or Louisiana or, you know, that, that area where the soil, like they, they had to tell people, don't let your kids play on the lawn and on the soil, because I don't know if it was mercury, I can't remember what it was, but they had so many industrial parks in that area that the soil had become literally toxic and people were getting cancer just from, you know, so they were, and I, I almost feel like the name of the, the area was Cancer Valley or Death Valley or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, and, and, and it's just so amazing to hear that the, the soil can get to that point where even just stepping on it could infect you with this this poison, these heavy metals that can now lead to cancer and all these other things. So I don't know, have you ever heard of this? Well, it's a very common story. So yeah. I, I'm thinking you're referring to lead because lead is one of those that's everywhere. So it could be lead, but this story is not unique. I, I, earlier you referred to cadmium. Mm -hmm. In Japan, they have that issue with cadmium. So there's so much cadmium in certain area, in a certain part of Japan where they had to move all, you know, ask the people to vacate that area because the cadmium concentration is just so high. Um, where I did my studies in China, especially in Southern China, there are so many different um, cities where they have these um, parcels of land where the government have to forbid farmers from growing um, any food in those parcels of land because mm -hmm. these different heavy metal concentrations are so high, especially if the area is where they mine for um, iron ore, you know, to build steels and stuff like that. Yeah, It brings up the, uh, um, the heavy metals up with them. Uh, or if there were pesticide, pesticide companies. In the past, pesticides were used heavily, right? And these pesticides, they, they, we use a lot, they contain a lot of heavy metal. So they um, put a lot of heavy metals back in the soil. In fact, areas that were, um, you know, that profited a lot from slavery and cotton growth are normally always contaminated because the chilling buck, one of the pesticides they use to get rid of the chilling buck, contains a lot of arsenic in it. Oh. And yeah, it did a very good job get rid of all the <laughs> chilling bugs. You get more cotton, but now, you don't grow cotton in these fields anymore. The farmers need to switch the crop. Yeah. They are growing other food crops in those fields. And these food crops now are accumulating this arsenic. I'm well, going elsewhere. My goodness. But but can you <laughs> can you maybe reassure me and the guests who are watching that the Bahamas is hopefully nowhere near 
increase levels. But yeah, um, definitely in the Bahamas, we don't <laughs> have much industrial activities yet. <laughs> see? So, mm-hmm. and we don't grow much of our food anyway. So, <laughs> I don't know if it's reassuring. <laughs> so, we don't have to worry, even if we had it there. Yeah. But in, generally, in the Bahamas, it's quite um, clean for a lot of the heavy metals that elsewhere will have problems with. Uh, and that's because yeah. we've never been an industrialized place. Even during slavery, we never really was producing lots of sugarcane or cotton. Uh, yeah. We were always a paradise, even for the slaves. <laughs> that can be controversial. <laughs> I, I, know, I mean, uh, compared <laughs> to uh, other Caribbean countries where people work sunset to sun, sunrise to sunset, uh, yeah. and so on, but it, in that aspect, but you don't, we don't really have much. But um, I, I did see a, a paper that talks about fishes this morning, I feel, that contains so many uh, uh, um, pharmaceuticals now. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's for another episode. I'm going to give me a fish <laughs> expert. But I do, um, and I, I just, I see these two questions, and this will be my last personal question for you. And just to tie it almost back to the marine environment, or just the coastal environment in general, really. I know, um, I think it was in our last episode, or maybe just in a conversation you, I, you and I have had, where, you know, the one of the issues that we do have as a country, especially in New Providence, is this dumping of um, of oil, dumping of um, uh, electronics, uh, dumping of refrigerators and washing and dryers and things like right into the depths of the bush and into near our coastline, which everything is pretty much coastal. And, and could this be a source of, you know, potentially contaminating our soil with heavy metals? In fact, I... Uh, um... Uh, Lashani, that's a very good question, and I'm very passionate about that. Um, and, and I think when I say what I say, a lot of people <laughs> disagree with me. It is a real problem. Dumping these, uh, your old refrigerator, your washer, it's definitely going to contaminate the soil. But my biggest fear is solar power. These solar cells contain very dangerous amount of heavy metals. And we don't have, or at least I don't know, I might be ignorant to this, we don't have enough regulation in place to track when somebody brings in these solar panels to ensure when they're done using them that they take them to a designated area and get rid of them. Solar panels contains, you know, dangerous level of heavy metals because these heavy metals help them to retain their function. They're, they're, they're really good in helping the, the, the solar panels to carry out their function. But if you throw one of them in your backyard, it can really contaminate the groundwater in that area. They, you know, in Southern China, these electronic wastes have caused whole cities to shut down agricultural drinking water from those areas because it wasn't properly managed. So that's something we really need to consider. Yes, renewable energy is good, but where are these solar panels going to die? Where are they going to rest after they no longer have use or they are damaged from after a hurricane? We really That's need to keep important. track uh, and who's bringing them in yeah. and ensure that when they no longer want them, they take them to a designated area to get rid of them. And the hybrid car battery is another, you know, it's another big thing. Heavy metals are very good with batteries. They are very good in helping them retain power and helping them produce power and helping extending their life. But the issue with using them is getting rid of it. And we're not being very good in ensuring that these wastes get disposed properly. And that can become very, very problematic. Because if you go to any urban area now, you'd see, yes, they are mo- they are moving to solar power. But you ask yourself, are these individuals really going to properly dispose these solar panels when they're done? This is so cringy, and 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 now you're gonna make me cheapers. Uh, <laughs> don't hide like this. Too late. You're gonna make me now when I go and find someone uh, who deals with this because I do think you know we have been hearing a lot of push to get solar power for obvious reasons. You know, our country gets a lot of sunlight, um, but I never once thought about like you said this disposal of these cells because I almost think that I like many people and myself or like myself, I'm sure many people had this assumption that solar power was this perpetual energy. Like we would never need to change the cells. And, and I didn't even oh. think about hybrid cars, but 
I don't, I must need to talk to someone from New Providence Ecology Park. Eh? I mean, they, they've been doing such a great job at trying to restructure, you know, disposal efforts there. And it's free. So people, if you know someone who has dumped a washer, dryer, refrigerator in the bush, tell them it's free to take it to the New Providence Ecology Park. But this is such an interesting topic. And I don't want to dive into this yet because I've actually had you on this video for 55 minutes after I literally just told you before it. Oh, we do so oh. well now. 30 to 45 minutes. But no, this I this is like a snapshot of literally anytime I talk to, to Will, it's, oh, I mean, he's talked long, very long, but um, I do want to address some of these questions. You like literally blew my mind with this solar panel thing. Um, so one person, Kayla Stubbs Moore. What, is, lots of stubs. Oh, oh, okay. So uh -huh. we need to go back to how we were in terms of agriculture. The family islands supplied food for New Providence in the early 1900s, and even as far as the 1970s and 80s, and I actually did not know this, um, do you think that we could get back to that? Like, I know you mentioned soil quality oh, is better. I, think, I, I, I definitely think we can, and we, we are doing it. I visited the dock a few weeks ago, and you would be surprised. There are about mailboats, huge mailboats, so many produce in them. And these produce are just transiently spending time on New Providence, and they're going elsewhere. So if we're producing enough, to sell to others, we definitely can sell to ourselves at a lower cost. I, I think just more incentive should be added for this. You know, uh, uh, and I always go back to China. Their farmers receive so many incentives that encourage them to produce these foods. They get free seeds. They, for example, when it's time to cultivate the crop, the government will provide the machinery that they need so they can do it much, much faster. Wow. And they, um, because the, the, the industry is subsidized so much, the yeah. farmers can sell the crop so for so low cost mm -hmm. and it's accessible to so much people. And the government invests so many monies in research. So the research is directly given to the farmers free of charge to better increase the crop quality. When they design a new rice seed and it's tested and it's shown to produce a higher yield, it's given to the farmers for free and they can use it. And, you know, and the, it, it's just so subsidized that it encouraged people to do it and they are able to feed themselves. I love that. That's such a great idea. I know um, there was a period of time about a year or two ago with the Ministry of Environment, because I also got one of these seed packets and this backyard farming kit. Um, so we, maybe we're moving in that direction. I, I'm hoping that we are, um, especially for the family islanders and these backyard farmers. Um, and Aria Thompson asks, what are your thoughts on foods labeled as organic? I have some qualms about this, but I'll let you take it. Is there really that much of a difference or is the word being used to justify the very high cost? Um, my humble opinion, no difference. Because um, you... For example, I, I, I visited a particular food store and they were selling lemon trees or, or um, lime trees. And it's like organic lime trees. And I'm confused, right? What's an inorganic lime tree? Is it thick, right? So there, there's no difference. In my opinion, I think it's just a, a marketing scheme. In fact, anything that's carbon and hydrogen is organic. So <laughs> you can put an organic sticker even on plastic lime and, you know, you know the plastic and call it organic. It, it's just a scheme. And you, especially today, it's very difficult to find, let's say, a plot of soil to grow enough food to sell on the market that was traditionally and always organic. Yeah. And even if this farm was just using, let's say, manure or other organic substances, what have they fed the animal that produced that manure, mm -hmm. right? Because you yeah. only can give out what you ate. Right. So. And I, and I, yeah, and I will add... Um, and I, I can say a lot of things now that I'm unaffiliated, but organic. And then when you see sustainable on things, you'd be so surprised if you just go and look at who the certifying body is that says, yes, you can put this organic sticker on, or yes, you can put the sustainable sticker on what the requirements are. Cause I think sometimes with organic, um, just to stay on topic, it's sometimes, okay, only if you stay under a certain amount of this type of fertilizer, which is being used on these quote unquote, not organic, you know, things. And, and yes, yeah, sometimes it is to justify this high cost because this person probably, probably 
really is doing it the old fashioned way, but because their yield is so low, they charge so much more. So I, I generally think that if the if the fruit and vegetable look good, you're eating fruit and vegetables and you're doing good. Buy yeah. local. Buy local where you can. So that's that's my two cents. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question about these batteries. As a general idea, even the battery from an electric car is the same issue. So it's like we want renewable and electric cars, but we have to consider how these batteries. Right. Okay. So we did we did touch on this. I just didn't see the question yet. Um, and we get a thank you to you. Definitely going to message you further because <laughs> she's in total yeah. agreement. Um, um, Ms. Thompson is one of my top students, you know, the oh. best, one of the best students I've ever taught, an awesome nurse. She's really going to make a difference. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and so D'Angelo asked, did we, did you make a distinction between what synthetic and organic fertilizer is? Um, he always thought organic just meant it was natural fertilizer. So can you quickly talk about what that distinction is between this organic fertilizer versus inorganic? So, so inorganic fertilizers are just like, you know, in the lab, we can manufacture nitrogen and mm -hmm. we can, the phosphate, well, I wouldn't say manufacture, we can produce it in large amount by, right. um, and the, and then when we added and these particular ratios, that will be our uh, um, inorganic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Our organic fertilizers tend to be plant-based or animal waste, have the same thing in it, but it's just not you know naturally produced, <laughs> naturally, naturally occurring. Was added to it. It's not, you know, I, I'm not just getting the nitrogen from some sodium nitrate or something like that. You know, some some chemical salt. I'm mm -hmm. just adding it directly from um from a plant, and once the plant decay, the nitrogen might have fixed from the atmosphere from the atmosphere is then released inside of the soil. Yeah, and I know you put Miss Thompson on the spot. <laughs> But thank you. Um, and you did have great questions, Ms. Thompson. Uh, but yeah, so I have here, I've had you for over an hour um, and I don't see any new questions, and, but I do still want to do some of the wrap up questions that I have for you. No um, do you do you foresee um, any challenges short term or long term if we were to start really pushing on the use of the sargasm as fertilizer? Uh, I think if it goes unregulated. And if farmers are not properly informed, we are definitely going to um, increase soil salinity because a lot of people, I think, just pick it up and drop it into the farm for a while yep. and then um, they plant later on. But, you know, you're adding a lot of salt into the soil and very few plants are going to grow quite well at high concentration of salt. Um, Gross. <laughs> you gotta be, yeah, you gotta be very careful where the seaweed is coming from. It can drift from an area where arsenic is no longer the only problem. You know, uh, if it drifts yeah. from Florida where they have mercury issues, it, it brings mercury, it brings other heavy metals, and once you add them into your soil, then that's just more room for uh, um, problem because you can't get rid of them. And if you think arsenic is bad, mercury is worse oh yeah yeah mercury and mercury is not too long to do what it has, what it has to do it, it doesn't waste time like arsenic no uh, yeah and mercury definitely is one of those those issues that we're seeing with fish yeah. but for another episode so another yeah i i think it should be regulated and i think um policy should really take into consideration of having instruments on island and ensuring that these access to these instruments are available to these individuals, to you know, backyard farmers and commercial farmers, so they know what's in the soil, and that mm -hmm. will definitely help them decide what to put on there. Because you could really, once you know what's in the soil, and we basically know the behavior of lots of these metals, you can really take full advantage of it. Where you mm -hmm. grow something in the soil, and you avoid the plant taking up that. Um, that that um, heavy metal from the soil yeah and i think yeah you're right i think um this is why science is just so important and and making informed policy decisions are so important um with anything in relation to our natural environment um, but i am curious and I, I would imagine a lot of our viewers we've had a lot of viewers tonight 
or this evening <laughs> are curious. Well, so if you could just quickly share, you know, what are some things you are currently working on and how could people connect with you? I know I have your email up there. I don't know why I have the at sign in front of it, but that is his email up there. If anyone is interested in speaking with him, do you take on interns? Do you do mentoring? Like how, what are you working on and how can people connect with you? Oh, awesome. So, um, my main focus is um, micros and the interaction with inorganic um, stuff, uh, inorganic part of the soil. But currently, I'm working on arsenic contamination and how it relates to methane emission from ponds. Mm. I'm also working on rainwater and how rainwater helps to generate. You know, recently we had a lot of rain. A lot okay. of us, especially near the airport, if you drive around there recently, it's still black. Yeah. So that has definitely changed the the soil biogeochemistry in that area. And I'm looking at how it helps to generate um, hydrogen peroxide. And hydrogen peroxide, you know, can cause the release of lots of metals. So that's one of my re recent areas. And, you know, I, I have a thing for arsenic. Um, <laughs> so this is a perfect episode for you. Yeah, so I, I, I'm still doing a lot of work with um, arsenic and market products. So arsenic in rice, arsenic in corn, arsenic in chicken. Uh, you know, have you guys noticed that not much places are selling chicken liver and the, the inner parts of the chicken, gizzards and liver anymore? I I can't say that I've noticed. Uh, this is, That was never a thing I bought. <laughs> <laughs> or you, you probably do have a point that you don't really hear about people buying these chicken livers and stuff anymore. Yeah, because recently we found that, you know, a lot of the arsenic is being stored in the liver and these things. So I'm totally interested in that. Mm -hmm. Like market surveys, go out in the market, purchase items, and then see what's inside it and report it to the public. But very soon we're going to have a paper out that's going to give you an idea of what rice is on the market the amount of organic, the amount of inorganic arsenic, and the potential risks that is associated with these rights. I know Lindy said it might be culturally too, and I think he means the whole chicken liver thing. I don't, I don't, I think there were some types of liver that I would hear older Bahamians eat. I know this younger generation really adapted. <laughs> to liver, right? No, I, I think I tasted liver once and it was interesting to say the least. But, um, <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> But yeah, do you um do you, do you take on any sort of like volunteers or people who might want to be research assistants or shadow under you? Well, every semester, or well, for every semester, I would take in a lot of final year project students. Mm -hmm. I'm very big in um, directing people into this area, so I would always invite students, and students come and find me all of the time, right? <laughs> because um, and, and we do a lot of soil projects. Um, one of the hot topics are using soil to produce batteries and they produce electricity. So we've done a, a lot of students have done a lot of projects with that. Nice. Uh, another So every year I, I take on about eight students, but the only issue is most of them are final year students. So they spend a year, work on the project, and then they're gone. But um, very soon, um, I hope to start teaching a research method and I, I'm definitely going to get a lot more students. But I'm always open to work with individuals, especially those that wants to understand the basic mechanisms, you know, why things happen and why we shouldn't do it, and the rules uh, or the long-term effect of using those stuff. Uh, I'm totally open to working with them. And I, and I think just to note again, um, I can't remember if you mentioned it earlier, but so, Dr. Gustav is a professor, or what's your is it officially a professor? I know academia can be so weird with giving out these titles. <laughs> well, um, I'm praying to become a, a full professor soon, but I'm currently an assistant professor of biology at the University of the Bahamas. Correct. So I definitely, as we noted a bit earlier, the University of the Bahamas it is so much promise and potential. So if you are a student who might be graduating high school soon or just interested in, in getting a college degree, please do not shy away from the University of the Bahamas. It's good sure. education, very good quality education. My credits transferred when I went off to school. You get a nice solid degree in the comfort of your home and you get to meet really cool scientists like Will. Like, and it's I free, and it's now. free. And it's not free. Money pays for it. I went to the University of the Bahamas. In fact, it was the hardest work I put in. I was so prepared that mm -hmm. when I went to grad school, 
it was, you know, I could have focused on what I wanted to study because I already had a strong foundation. Yeah. We, we, you know, my colleagues and I at the university, we, especially in the biology department, we have a very strong program. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we've trained, if not old, of the medical professionals or the um, environmentalists and other scientists here have done at least part or one of their degrees with us. Our credits are easily transferable. Yeah. Um, you learn a lot. You get uh, you, you get to experience individuals with broad, uh, you know, our department have individuals with very broad backgrounds from those that focus more on human biology and yeah. us that focus more on environment and, uh, and, and other stuff. The University of the Bahamas mm -hmm. is an amazing place. And yeah. even our professors, especially the local professors, all of us, every single one of us did at least one of our degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, the then College of the Bahamas. Right. And I know Aria um, says, we find you because you are very relatable. You effectively explain and you are passionate about this. Definitely an asset to this country. Science is amazing. And I could not agree more. Ever since I met Will, shout out to Shannon for connecting us. I've been just so fascinated by your intelligence and the way that you you talk about these different topics. You can feel the passion and you inspire people to want to know more. Um, so thank you for your service to the country. <laughs> I have to, I was educated by the country and mm -hmm. I need, you know, with all the country and the, the tax base money, I would have never achieved any of the thing that I have today. So I have to give back. I have to help the next generation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a must. It's not even up for debate. Right. And I will definitely second what you said. My one year that UB, um, well, it was still College of the Bahamas then, but that was the hardest year of college. And I think, like I said, it's a quality education and, and you can only go up from from attending the university, even if it is just to get that associate. You, you give yourself a really good foundation. But I am curious to know, you obviously inspire so many people. We have like some of your students here um, watching this episode. Who is somebody in your sector, you know, in in this biology and even this maybe with soil and microbes, who is someone that inspires you, whether they're from the Bahamas or international and why? Well, um, I would say that um, I, I've gotten into microbiology after I took my first microbiology course at the University of the Bahamas oh. with, um, um, Wood, his name was um, Woodrow Smith was his name. And he's a really good and awesome microbiologist. And I just was amazed by the way never use a PowerPoint presentation slide and he just walk in and say, today we're going to talk about this. And he was just able to, the way he explained stuff. So that was one of um, uh, of my, the main individuals that directed me into this field. And then doing my associate degree, I had um, Audrey Bullitt, Mr. Audrey Bullitt. He's also an amazing biologist. And those individuals, along with a lot of other professors like Dr. Totten, Dr. Stubbs, from they're still they're, not, they're my colleagues now. They have really directed and pushed me towards this uh, this field. And even today, every time think the going get tough, I still go to them and and, and get more wisdom <laughs> and see you know and get more fuel to continue mm. because they've been doing it much longer than me, and they basically know the ropes and they know the challenges and they would share the experience with you and how to continue and to make sure that you're successful. That's so important. Uh, I think that's such a blessing that you had so many mentors and now work with <laughs> some of them. Do you have any like final thoughts for our viewers, whether it be like a life lesson learned in your time working in the field or just some tips for someone interested? Well, my, I would tell anyone who is listening today, don't follow the, 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 the fashion. Go and do something that you like. If you like the sciences, go and do the sciences. If you like the humanities, go and do it. You can still, and you don't be afraid to do both. I was very confused if I wanted to be a chemist or a biologist. Well, I just did both. <laughs> I'm a biology and chemist where I, 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 I use both of the skills. And the same can be done if you are really good in English and good in science. You can do what Lashanti does, right? A science communicator and help share the, the information. I, I, so do something that you like, mm -hmm. do something that you see yourself getting old doing and ensure mm -hmm. that when you go to work, you're not going to be miserable. And once you decide that, just go for it. I love that. Do something you see yourself growing old doing because uh, yes. I'm very much a big proponent of don't ever seek to retire, right? Make sure that the work 
that you are doing is something you're passionate about and something that lights your soul on fire, that you wake up every day and you're so excited for this topic or whatever this is that you're going to do, because that's what living is. And if you're not, if you're doing anything different, you're dying. Like you're not living, you're dying. So I totally agree. Awesome. And I just want to say, again, thank you so much. I always expect an amazing episode with you. Uh, you're such a brilliant scientist. And I definitely look forward to having you back again, maybe talking about, like Rhea suggested, the effects of rain on soil in the Bahamas. Hopefully oh, that's awesome. we get some good data <laughs> soon. And maybe next season we'll see you again, maybe even using soil to produce batteries. Like maybe that's awesome. the solution instead of solar power. So I'm so excited. Um, thank you to all our viewers. And I hope to see you guys next Sunday. This was a great episode. Oh, I thought you were gonna say bye. Oh, bye. Oh, I, <laughs> <Here's> bye. <laughs> you just bye, bye. Like, um, I also want to echo Lashanti. Uh, I'm really thankful for all of those that are present today. Very awesome questions. And shout out to um, a lot of my nursing and bioethics students. You know, I, I try to put the science everywhere where those and even fields that are very remote from soil mm -hmm. still come and try to get a second dose. I always tell them, you know, it's going to be a bittersweet relationship between us, but you will never be able to leave me. There you go. There you go. As we can see, they followed you all the way onto my show. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, me Bye, too. everyone. Thanks for tuning Bye -bye. in.